Hello, and welcome to the Judo Way of Life podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Matt DeQuino. Matt is an Australian judoka, coach, author, Olympian, two times Australian national champion, a three times Oceania champion, and the founder of Beyond Grappling, which in 2020 was ranked as one of the top online platforms for judo in the world by the International Judo Federation. Hello, Matt. Thank you for joining us this evening. Hey, thanks for having me. I'd like to get started by giving a bit of a history of your, your judo career up to today. I started judo when I was five, competed heaps, really liked it, and I uh, set my sights on the Olympics. So I went to the Beijing Olympics 2008 and then uh, did a few worlds as well and then tried for the London Olympics. I missed out on that by a little bit. And now I, uh, a few years later, I opened my own judo club called Beyond Grappling Club. It's now one of the biggest ones in Australia and it's, I love it. It's awesome, full of great coaches and great people. And so that's my kind of my judo career, I guess. And then online, I have like a judo books and DVDs that I sell online and a popular YouTube channel and stuff like that. So that's kind of uh, me in a nutshell. And then going back to maybe the reason why you started judo. So yeah. I was a quite a young age to get into it. Yeah, that's right. You know, I was the youngest of uh, three. So I got my older sister and my brother and I. Uh, and my brother and I fought every single day. We shared a room, so I got beaten up a bit. <laughs> and uh, we wrestled, you know, before school and after school and on weekends. And my mum was like, oh, man, I'm sick of this. Let's get these boys in a sport where they can wrestle each other. And so she got me started in the local um, kind of police boys club, judo. So that's when I started it and liked it straight away. Liked that I could beat a bigger person with, um, you know, proper technique, timing and sinagi. So, um yeah, that's how we got started into it. And yeah, we did competitions pretty early on. Yeah, and I somehow started competitions at a young age, but managed to stick around for the next 30 years sort of thing where a lot of people burn out quick and quit. Yeah, it was something I've experienced. I'm the older brother um, of the two. Uh, my little brother, I think, was he started at five and he unfortunately sort of wasn't able to do competitions until a bit older. Mm-hmm. I think it's a little bit different in the UK. Um, and he'd sort of lost interest by that point. But we, uh, same, same wrestling, destroying the house. <laughs> yeah, stuff right. just, uh, a safer place to try and do it. And what, what was it about the competitions that you enjoyed so much? So 30 years is a long time to be competing. Uh, what's yeah, kept you coming I, back for more? I think early on, I mean, I, I won a lot. And most kids enjoy what they like winning, right? So I won a lot of comps at a young age. And I think even at a young age, you do a whole whole season of soccer or rugby, you get one trophy at the end of the year. But judo, you can win as many medals as you want. So I think that at a young age is one of the factors is you just get medals every tournament. And so I had, you know, get, remember going to school, you know, the following Monday and, hey, I won a tournament on the weekend. Here's my medal. So I think that, but it's just fun to compete. Like I think I'm just born a competitor and I just enjoy competing and and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think that's just what keep me kept me in it and then once you set your eyes on you know going to the olympics i did that when i was 12 when my coach tom hill pretty much solidified his spot at the, at the sydney olympics i was like that's it that's what i want to do i want to go to the olympics for judo i want to travel the world i want to get as good as i can be and i want to try to get an olympic medal so that's kind of and obviously when you when you make that your choice you're going to be doing a lot of competitions from then on out and you mentioned in the the intro there about your qualifying for the beijing olympics and competing there what was that like? Oh, the Olympics is like, I tell people it's kind of like going for your dream job interview but not getting the job. I was at my dream place. I, I can't believe I made the Olympics and then I lost first round. So I was like, I got to the interview but I didn't get the job. <laughs> like, um, So the Olympic Village is a funny place but it's, it's and the Olympics is funny in general in that it's just a massive fanfare and that sort of stuff. But there's, a, there's more losers at the Olympics than winners, you know, so it's kind of a, it, it's it's both a somber place and a happy place at the same time. But it was absolutely fantastic to fight, you know, and I lost by Ipon. After my match, I was like, oh, I just want one more shot, like one more shot to win another match, to get, to start that road to a gold medal sort of thing. So, no, yeah, but it was absolutely fantastic. I had a great time. I know after day two when my other teammate, Stephen Brown, fought, after day two, I was like, you know what? I'm done with the Olympics. I, I just want to go home. Like, I was only here to kind of compete. I wasn't here for a holiday. I wasn't here to watch other sports. I just only came to fight at the Olympics. And now that I'm finished, I just kind of want to go home. But my fiance and our wife at the time said, Matt, we're here. But we may as well enjoy it. So 
I had a great time after that, but it was just kind of a, you know, you had to kind of process it and grieve it, I guess, and then try to enjoy yourself from, from there, which I did and it was great. And then you mentioned the lead up to sort of 2012. Now, I know from listening to you on previous uh, podcasts that you've done, around around 2010, there was quite a, a shift in the rules for judo. I remember you listening to you say that affected your judo a little bit. Is that correct? Yeah, big time. See, I was a, I was a Tagaruma, Marotagari kind of counter player, Kataguruma. And uh, yeah, in 2010, were they, 2010 or 2009, they did the, you could do a leg grab as a part of a counter attack. And then they banned leg grabs completely. And so, yeah, my, all my judo was done. It was finished. And, and that was also partly my fault for not expanding my judo and sticking to the kind of the three major throws that I had and not trying to improve and diversify. So, yeah, once the Federation banned my judo, I, I went to the local judo club and I couldn't throw local green belts, you know. And uh, here I am, some Olympian, you know, some second or third degree black belt. I can't even throw the green belts with Osadagari and Tai Toshi and all that because I spent so long doing kind of wrestling style techniques. I contemplated switching to wrestling, but I just loved judo so much nicer. So I stuck around and didn't try to make the London Olympics. But yeah, it was a massive hurdle to revamp and and re try to rejig your whole judo mid Olympic cycle is pretty tricky. When you say rejig, did mm. you have a particular plan? Did you or was it just a case of right, okay, well I'm not allowed to do any of these techniques. Did you have any any techniques that were usable that were sort of not banned uh, and you focus on them or was it just all the way back to the drawing board and start again? Yeah, well, it was about, about this time. I, I, think, I don't even know when I started Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, maybe 15 years ago. What I found was after the leg grabs were banned, I still had a good drop COE and I still had a not bad culture in Makakomi. And, but what I did have was a sumigeish and groundwork. And so my Nerwaza was pretty good and I mainly won all my matches in Nerwaza. I remember one Pan America tour, that would have been 2010, 2011. We did like Miami World Cup. We did Venezuela, El Salvador and Venezuela uh, kind of World Cups or whatever they were called back then, Opens. I think I had 13 matches and I lost four, but I won the other seven or all in Nawaza. And so, yeah, I think the Nawaza just became my strongest point. And I think that was one because of the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu I'd been doing and two just because – um. Yeah, I was I was seem to be okay at it. That's why I, I saw a video of you recently. Is that where you were trying the flying amber? I think you might have done about four or five yes. of them on yeah, that, that one guy um, who seemed to be slightly disgruntled with you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was where I was doing some flying ambers. That yeah, was fantastic. Uh, the, the week the week prior, how about this? I fought a guy called Wanda Mateo, who's actually on the world tour at the moment in seventy threes, and he was beating me in the Miami World Cup by four yukos. With 30 seconds to go, no, three Yukos. With 30 seconds to go, he throws me for another Yuko. So now he's up four Yukos. He gets me in Kami Shiogatami. And I'm like this. I'm on the bottom. I'm like, I'm so tired. I can't throw this guy. I'm going to lose this match by four Yukos and then get held down. I'm like, I'm going to try to do a Soto Garuma Jimmy while he's holding me down in Kami Shiogatami. Anyway, I, I whack on this choke and he starts gurgling. And then before you know it, he's unconscious holding me down. And then I roll him off me and he's unconscious on the ground and I win the match. <laughs> How funny is that? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's amazing it's, sometimes those the, um, the unusual techniques that sometimes just work. Well, it's not even so much unusual, but just, just, having, just having to go at something in, in the, the, you know, the, the end of a fight and then just you know, pulling it off. Yeah, that's right. I've been on the receiving end of both of those, but I, I, you know, just that Hail Mary technique at the end and you, know, you win. And there's been plenty of times I think I've been beaten in the last sort of five, ten seconds of a fight. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So you've mentioned Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and wrestling as other sports that you've done. Mm-hmm. Why Why have you stuck to judo? Because, I, you know, I don't know you as a wrestler. I don't know. I, I know you do a lot of the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but, mm. you know, you, you're known as primarily as a judo player. You know, what, what is it that's kept you in the sport? Uh, I think that judo, I just love it. Like, I just love judo. I don't know. I just, it's clean, it's crisp, it's nice. I like judo players. I just love learning. I don't know. I think that's what just keeps me in the sport. Like, I literally just, I just love everything about it. I love learning. I'm a nerd. I'll talk about judo moves all day long. I love helping people. I love having people run classes so I can learn from them. Like, I really just love kind of, I guess, all elements of it. I love kata. I love competition. I love, 
uh, teaching beginners. I love looking at breakfalls and different ways to teach that. Like I really do just love all of it. I think I just like learning and knowledge. Where And I just think in terms of wrestling and judo, like I feel like uh, judo is just a, a nice, a cleaner look where wrestling is just a little bit slipperier, a little bit not as clean as judo. So, yeah, I just really enjoy them. Fantastic. I want to ask you something because – you you mentioned that you you had to go back to the drawing board and you had to sort of change your style of judo and learn judo again. So about ten years ago now, and I look at what you've achieved in sort of the recent years in terms of this extensive catalog of instructional judo videos covering all range of techniques. Um, where, where where was there a bit of a shift in sort of where you went from only being able to learn this know the certain techniques to this incredible depth uh, of judo as a coach? Yeah, I think. Um, I was just going to say, where where was that sort? Of, was there a switch in your head where you sort of went right? Okay, well, this is I'm going to learn this to be able to teach it and and develop. You know that I started putting stuff on YouTube, and around about a time I was at the a Wollongong camp, and um, I was talking to Morgan your coach, Morgan Angel Davies. And, um, and I said to Morgan, whenever I fight a lefty, they just crush me in. Even when I have an inside lapel grip, they just crush me in. And he goes, I'll show us. And so I got an inside lapel grip and he looks at me, you know, the Morgan's look, and he kind of gives this half smirk and he goes, are you serious? I said, what? He goes, are you serious? I was like, what? He's like, your hand goes here and not here. Like my hand was at his chest level, but it's got to be at the ear, right? Like I've yeah. got an inside lapel grip, but it's going to be the ear. And he looked, he looked at me like I was the stupidest dude he ever met. And he goes, how do you not know this? And I'm like, well, no one's taught me that. And he goes, this is like fundamentals. And so I think that was the shift for me of like, okay, I need to stop doing judo and I need to start learning judo. And, and so I started, rather than just going to training and do a thousand reps of Wichikomi or a hundred Nagakomi, actually stopping and going, how does this throw work? When I do this, where are they moving? And actually get I almost trying to get the understanding of the why behind the what. Why does this work? How does this work? And actually starting to understand movement and mechanics and principles rather than, and I think a lot of my judo career, I beat people through fitness, strength, through mat control, through being able to play a referee and penalties and through speed rather than through just technical prowess if that makes sense i was just a grinder like you look at my old matches i was just a wrestler style fit strong and could just grind you out i was fitter than anyone at a high intensity sort of thing right so and then i switched to like well if morgan told me that this is a beginner's move and i don't know it i've got a heck of a lot of learning to do so i kind of just shifted to st start stopping and thinking about what i'm doing and actually going for a, a technique and going okay why didn't that work Oh, because I did a drop COE and I dropped really fast, but had no pull on the sleeve down. So they just poshed up and hip defense or, you know, so I just started switching from doing to thinking. And that I think has helped me develop a way deeper understanding of judo and also asking questions. You know, if you come to my judo club, I'm always asking my other black belts questions about what videos are they watching? What are you learning? What's your latest thing you've learned and taught? And what are you teaching at your other club? And, and so I'm always learning and, and gathering information, I guess, um, rather than saying this is my my club and I'm the boss and I know everything when I know I don't know anything and I can always learn from other people. So I think having those two uh, things has helped me develop way deeper understanding of judo. But in saying that, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. Like I, sometimes I go training and I go, I, mean, I don't know anything. Like sometimes I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> you know, like I've, I'm just scratching the surface of judo and I so wish I started this journey 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that look of Morgan's um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you mentioned. Do you find that, that, that you say the the coaching, so you've got your own judo club, you know, you've got your own players now. Do you find that coaching has helped you learn judo better yourself? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Once again, it helps you. When you teach a technique and you, you have those people in the class go, what about this and what about that? So it helps you go, oh, I don't know, let me come back with me. You know, or you'll sometimes I'll teach a move and then I'll watch someone do it. I'll go, that's that just doesn't look right. Does that feel right? No, it doesn't. Like, I don't know what come here. Let me have a look. Oh, you need to do this. Oh, you know, like it the more you teach, the better you get at teaching because it's a skill in itself. And the more you 
ask, get people to ask questions, the more you understand and learn, you know. So I definitely think coaching has helped me be better at coaching and understanding of judo, absolutely. I could resonate that with that also. I think I think I've learned more about judo in the sort of the past four years since I've been you know, my coaching hours have just gone through the roof mm. than the the twenty years before that, where I was, you know, a competitive player. And so you to explain it to a variety of different people. It's all right, you know, understanding it yourself. But then once you've got to explain it in a variety of different ways to so everyone can learn learn the technique. Mm-hmm. It really makes you you think deeper about the the throw and you know why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I want to go back to something you mentioned when you were talking about your time at the Beijing Olympics and link it to something you, I saw you put up online recently about the the sort of the morning period. Uh, so yep. grieving period. I think grieving was the word you used uh, after your fight in Beijing. And I saw the other day you put something up um, congratulating the people that didn't qualify for the Olympics, mm. you know, and that might be perceived by some as, you know, a strange thing to do. Yeah. I found it, you know, very interesting because it's maybe a side of things people don't always acknowledge or talk about. When you said you, you grieved the, the fight, can you, can you go into a little bit more detail about what you meant by that? Yeah. As in just for the Beijing year. Well, I mean, you put your whole, your whole life's on hold for this one event. Yeah. Uh, and there's events along the way. There's nationals and tournaments and overseas trips and stuff. But once you qualify for the Olympic, like the whole, I was 12 when I when I was like, I want to go to the Olympics. And then I'm 22, 23, maybe I just turned 23. So I'm finally there. Like we're talking the amount of money and reps of which Kami and overseas trips and getting thrown in Japan and Korea and like the amount of sleepless nights you have about winning or losing a tournament. Like there's so much stuff goes into trying to make the Olympics or making the Olympics. Like it's just endless amounts of stuff, like your entire life and identity is shaped in this whole I'm trying to make the Olympics thing. And especially with the Olympics, you kind of, you'll find just in social circles, people will say, you know, you might be, I don't know, at a cafe or something, hey, this is my friend Matt, he's trying to make the Olympics. It kind of, there's this social cred that other people have because you're trying to do something. And so you find that's quite a big deal as well, like for other people rather than yourself. So there's all this stuff goes in the Olympics and you go there and you lose first round and you're like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> this is not what I cracked, what I, you know, and the, so I fought day one. So I didn't do opening ceremony, fought day one, lost by an Obi Otoshi. Who the heck gets thrown with an Obi Otoshi? Like a Harborelli sort of weird throw that only Russians and Georgians do. It's not even done anymore really and i'm like man i got i was like a victim of going to japan all the time because japanese don't throw you with that, those sort of throws and anyway and then i was rooming with a 66 kilo guy who was fighting the next day and so here i am uh, i fought i lost i watched the gold medal matches it was incredible I hung out with my family went back to the, the olympic village here i am sitting at midnight 11 o'clock at night midnight i'm having dinner by myself and I'm just like, this sucks. <laughs> like, here I am, 23. I've reached the goal of making the Olympics, not a medal, but getting here. And I fought, lost first round, and now I'm sitting here by myself, and this sucks. <laughs> like, is this what it's cracked up to be? Now, if I got a gold medal, it'd be a different story. But it was just going, wow, this is, is this is it. Okay, well, this kind of sucks. And then days later, the next day at breakfast, some swimmer or some cyclist, I don't even know who it was, was like, so when are you fighting? When are you competing? Oh, I competed yesterday. How'd you go? I lost first round. Oh, when do you fight next? That's it. It's finished. They go, what? You finished already? It's only day two. That's right. I'm finished. And they're like, oh, that's weird. Like, it's just weird. Yeah. So anyway, you have to grieve it. You come home and, and then I just started the second part of my life. So six months, I think five months later, I got married. I started uni and then kind of just started this different kind of thing and still try to make London, missed out. And then after that, I then tried to make London for wrestling, missed out, and then I retired from competition. But in that period, I kind of made a decision to stop competing after London. Yeah, so I guess but you have to grieve it and have to realise. Uh, and then after London, um, I was talking to – so I lost. Then I called my pastor because I'm a churchgoer. And he said, Matt, you know, the people like you for who you are, not what you do. Like, And I thought, gee whiz, that's – that is true because people like me for who I am, not because I'm some black belt judo dude that went to the Olympics. Like people either like me for who I am, not 
And so what I want, I was going to do another video for YouTube and just talk about that your identity is not a, an Olympian or, or, you know, like you're more than that. Like you and I are more than just judo players. Like I'm, I'm a dad, I'm a brother, I'm a son, I'm a friend. I'm so many other things and judo and grappling is a part of that, but it's not who I am. I'm so much more than that. So yeah, kind of just being aware of that is super important to know. Yeah. It's, I find it interesting you talk about that identity. Um, and this is something I've had to go through myself. And I think a lot of athletes go through it at a certain point in their career. Is that something you, is it something you figured out for yourself? In terms of you know separating uh, yourself from the you know maybe the identity of a judo player or someone going to the Olympics, or did you do you have help with that in any way? My wife's pretty switched on with like counselling stuff. She's just a really nice, kind person that's really good at listening. But she ended up going and she just got her social work degree and counselling and stuff. So she kind of helped me because we talk all the time. But I think it's just about. I remember being young. If someone said to me. Oh, here's my friend Matt. He's one day he's going to go to the Olympics for judo. The Olympics for judo. I'd be like, I think I was the coolest guy ever, <laughs> you know, because my identity was so wrapped up in that. But I think as you get a little bit older, you kind of, yeah, I think just like I said, the first time in my past, I said, Matt, people are like you for who you are, not because what you do. That was a big like, oh, yeah, like people do like me for who I am. Like if I quit judo today, you know, people like me for who I am, not because I'm a judo coach or whatever. So I think it's just really important to do that. But if you do need to see counseling, um, go go to a counselor or whatever, or talk to people and your mentors and stuff like that to to kind of help you kind of understand who you really are. But I think also, I remember I went to a, a, a psych and they were like, "So what do you value?" And I was like, "Hard work, dedication." She said, what, "But what are your values?" I was like, "What do you mean?" She's like, "What what do you value in life?" And I had no idea. And I remember when someone said to me, well, "Matt, what makes you angry?" I'm like, "I don't know." And like, I was like, I literally don't know what makes me angry and what I value in life. Like, because I'm so focused on myself that I just have these blinkers on about life. And then, you know, through reading and stuff like that, you slowly start developing, okay, what do I actually value in life? And, you know, what, what are my morals and my values and that sort of stuff? And kind of just, you yeah, go on that personal development journey sort of thing. I was even talking to a friend of mine the other day. His wife was an Olympian as well. He goes, I think she's kind of finally realized She's no longer an Olympian. Now, she competed in 2012. So even for her, it's taken 10 years to realize I'm no longer an Olympian anymore. Like I'm at, you know, it's even taken her 10 years. So I think it's, yeah, just an interesting thing. And I think we all need to go on that sort of journey of that personal development of, you know, who you are and who, who, who do you think you are and that sort of stuff. Yeah. That was great. As when, when I saw that post that you put up about it and, uh, yeah, I thought it was fantastic because I think it's something that's not talked about enough. and as you said earlier on, you know, there's there's more people that have lost at the Olympics than have won. You know, so there's a lot of people going through that where, you know, they've countless sacrifices that they've, you know, made to get to that point. And, you know, there's more people yeah. leaving the Olympics disappointed than are happy. And I don't think it's a side of the things that are spoken about enough or acknowledged enough. It seems to be changing. You know, people like yourself that, you know, sharing their thoughts on, on it. I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's just important for people to know that, like, and I think I put that post up because I do motivational speaking at schools. Like I work for the Australian Olympic Committee. And honestly, people, these Olympians that missed out this year or qualified this year, they will look back in 10 years and be proud of themselves for trying. Like you, you and I know so many judo players that are like 45, 40, or however old they are. And they go, do you know what? I was actually pretty good at judo. But then I went and got a full-time job and I never actually tried or – then I quit and I came back in my 30s or I quit and came back in my 40s. Gee, I wish I stuck with it. Like all these people are going to look back and go, oh, I was actually pretty good. I could have gone somewhere, but I quit. And so all these Olympians that didn't make it, they're going to look back and go, do you know what? I'm so glad I tried because in 15 years' time, they'll look back and they'll be proud of themselves for actually trying their absolute best to get there. And that is a testimony in itself, you know? And yeah, and sometimes you not making it is a better testimony to the up-and-coming people that you, you don't always get your dreams like <laughs> it's not all sunshine and rainbows you know like it's you know there's a lot more losers and winners in the world but the real winners are the ones that try but you get what i mean though like a lot of people chase their dreams and and um and miss out but at least they tried and had the opportunity to and that's super important yeah we um we were always brought up with that sentiment at our judo club there was a plaque on the wall this is back in the uk 
Bake Up Judo Club, there's, uh, I think it was Roosevelt who said it, but this this was like a condensed version. And it was far better to dare mighty things than to rank with those poor timid souls that know neither victory nor defeat. Yeah, that's right. You know, the idea is, you, you know, you're better off giving it a go and failing than just not even bothering giving it a go at all. Yeah. You know, that's the thing, though, but we in judo and in most sports, especially at Olympic sports, we say that, but every uh, – I said this at my state meeting. Oh, we don't value participation. Oh, yes, we do. Okay, then when was the last time you gave out an award, a state award for participation? We only give out awards for people that win tournaments. <laughs> and so we say we're all about participation, but in actual fact, we're only rewarding competition winners and players. And we, we as a culture don't reward. But at my club, we reward people that are like the people that are most consistent to training, they get an award. They might be terrible at you. They're actually not. They're actually all right. But we are actually rewarding participation over winning medals in tournaments because in the long run, people that turn up and try are going to succeed further in life than the dudes that win tournaments at 12 years old and then quit when they're 14 because they haven't developed that the, the character of perseverance and resilience and, and that sort of and losing but getting up and trying again. Yeah, so it's just funny. So, so I said to our state, we should give out an award for whoever competes the most in one year, we give them a, a medal or a trophy for whoever competes the most. They can lose first round every tournament, but they've done 20 tournaments this year. That's worth celebrating. It's just an interesting thought. It's a great idea. I was, <laughs> my brain instantly went to, I want to steal that idea. <laughs> Judo is so much more than competition. That gets lost in a lot of clubs. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, it's a really interesting viewpoint that you just made. Well, what I'd like to ask you now, I know you said you do work with schools in motivational speaker and obviously at your own club. Has anyone, I mean, you said that you were, when you were 12, you decided you wanted to go to the Olympics. Um, have you any any of the kids that you've coached or mentored come and tell you that they want to go to the Olympics? Yeah, so I've got some adults that are trying to get there, but kids, yeah, I have one girl who is nine and she said to her mum, I want to go to the Olympics for judo. And her mum's like, yeah, cool, sweet. Anyway, then the mum rang me and she's like, okay, Matt, two years ago she told me she wants to go to the Olympics and I just thought she was just saying it, but it's been two years and she's still saying it. So what do we need to do? You know, <laughs> so I was like, that's awesome. So that's the only kid that's told me I want to make the Olympics. I know others have the definitely, like the kids at my club definitely have the skills and to get there. But I also think that a lot of kids at judo don't know you can actually go to the Olympics for judo. And so I'll sometimes say to the kids when I line them up, and you know, I've got 150 kids in my program, 140, I don't even know how many. I'll say, you know, what do you do when you want to grow up? You know, I want to be a soccer player. I want to be a rugby player. I want to be a dancer. I want to be all these things. I'm like, do you know you guys can, you can also be judo coaches too, you know? They're like, really? I'm like, well, I'm a judo coach. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that was an option. Like kids don't know it's an option because we just kind of don't tell them it's an option because judo is not on TV. Not many people around have been in the Olympics. And I don't promote the Olympic thing too much at my club because it was so long ago. And second of all, I don't want to be this, I don't want that to be like a, a cap on other things. So I don't really promote it very often. Like I don't wear my belt with the Olympic rings on it or, or whatever. Yeah. So I think sometimes kids don't even know they could get there. So I've got to say to kids, you're actually pretty good at judo. You know, you work hard, you train hard, you know, you, you can win some matches. You know, you could go to the Olympics for judo, right? And they're like, oh, I didn't know you could. <laughs> anyway, so I think we've got to, I don't, I didn't think at my club was to actually educate kids on the, the fact that you can make the Olympics. Maybe we're going to put you on the spot now a little bit, but what, what advice would you give to someone who was, thinking about what going to the Olympics, uh, whether it was in judo or maybe another sport. Yeah. What age though? Oh, that's just to be real. It's going to be hard work. We'll go with maybe nine or 10. Okay. You, know what I mean? you mentioned there was a, one yeah, of your younger yeah. players. Yeah. I'd say, I'd say, I'd say probably the same thing. It's, it's, it's hard work and it's sacrifice. But for that age, it would just be still, I guess, application would just be awesome. Okay. Here's how you're going to get there. You're going to come and train, you're going to have fun. You're going to develop your judo. We're going to get you in comps just for fun. And it's all about learning. So that definitely age will just be learning. And in the end, you know kids, put it this way, the kids are going to go to the Olympics are the ones that love judo. People that don't love judo don't really go to the Olympics because they don't really like it. We love judo, don't we? Like we, we love it and it just, it just shows. And so we're going to, we, we are always around it. People that don't love things, don't try not to, they don't sacrifice for it. That makes sense. 
in the end, I'd say to older kids, the dream is free, but the journey is going to cost you. That's a, a quote, I think. The dream is free, but the journey is going to cost you. Like to make the Olympics, it's hard work, it's pain, it's sacrifice. And are you willing to pay that in order to, to get to where you want to go? And they say that you don't, I think Zig Ziglar says you don't pay the price of success, you enjoy the price of success. And so it's like, it's all, it's all the sacrifice, time, your body, relationships, so many things. It's just sacrifice and time. And so are you willing to pay that? And it's absolutely amazing to just try to do that. And so that's, I guess, my, would be my advice. Yes, yeah, yeah. the, uh, maybe the darker side of sport that people don't usually see. Yeah, that's right. And I, in my motivational speaking, I have three segments. First one's setting goals. And Daniel Kelly did a podcast with um, someone else recently and he said, I made a goal to make the London Olympics and then I worked backwards. And so your goal is, your, your, your goal is what's your far goal, like the one in the distance, and then you work backwards in smaller goals. So my first one, you want to, so my, my, my coaches, I want to make the Olympics. I said, cool, Matt. First thing you got to do is make the state team. Then you got to win the nationals. Then you can make the junior Australian team, then the senior Australian team. Then you got to win in Oceania. So they gave me a pathway to get to the Olympics. And so you can give someone a pathway. The second part I talk about is believing in yourself. You actually got to believe in yourself to get there because there's going to be people in your life that say, listen, man, you're not going to, you're not going to get there. That's way too hard or you don't have the skills or whatever. So you got to believe in yourself and kind of ignore other people and listen to trusted people. And the third one is that challenges will make you stronger. And we all know people that had one knee reco and quit judo or one shoulder reconstruction and they stopped competing. So we have a choice to make in the challenges, whether it's finances or injuries to either keep going or to stop. And that's only up to us. And so that's kind of my motivational speech. That's what I talk about in all the schools I go to. From kind of year three, year uh, not three-year-olds, probably from eight-year-olds to 12-year-olds, I talk to them about that. Yeah, fantastic. Maybe just like to finish with asking you what's next. You seem to have got a lot of accolades under your belt so far in terms of, you know, like you said, the Olympics and um, as a competitive athlete, but then, uh, you know, as a coach, you've got an incredible sort of empire, really. But, you know, what's next for you? What's next? I think for me, just continually running my club and helping. I think I got multi layers. So, first layer is just keep having a club that people can come to and have fun and enjoy the benefits of judo. So, keep that flowing. That's the first one. Secondly, is keep helping. I've got a lot of coaches and they're just getting better and better at coaching. So keep kind of equipping and allowing my coaches to coach judo classes because they're just getting better and better. Third layer is just helping my athletes get to where they want to go. And then, I got, like I said, I've got a few athletes that try and make the Olympics and just try and help them all out. And then, and then this is just for my judo club. And yeah, and then one day I get a full-time location and they can really start putting in some high-performance programs because then we can run more classes per week and that sort of stuff yeah so that's kind of what next and i've got some dvds in the in the making and yeah and then yeah and just do some tournaments i'm keen to get back into some judo tournaments compete in some judo and some brazilian jitsu again so i'm keen to do that as well awesome do you have a, do you have a, tie, um, a name for which competition you're gonna get into first or is it just see when everything sort of opens up again yeah well i did the ACT open uh, about what a month yeah. and a bit ago actually we were talking before the podcast about kind of mindset and stuff like that just quickly because I stopped competing in 2012 in judo and then I switched to Brazilian jiu-jitsu tournaments and it, I was purple belt and I either I blitzed everyone got my brown belt and then when I got my brown belt I either I either smashed dudes in 30 seconds or I lost in 30 seconds like it was like black and white in, in my Brazilian jiu-jitsu career like I would either beat dudes easily or get smashed there was no like grinding matches and then my wife said I said Miss Sam I just want to I just want to have some hard matches like the one where I strangle that dude out with 30 seconds to go, the flying arm bars where I'm, you know, those head clashing, grinding matches. You said, Matt, maybe that's not Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Maybe you should get back into Judo. And I was like, yeah, all right. So I went to the Nationals two years ago. I came fifth. I lost to Nathan Katz and Pedro. And, uh, and I had five matches and they were all like grinding matches, except Nathan beat me with about 30 seconds. All the other ones were like five minute golden score matches. I had the best fun ever. So I did some judo. Anyway, two months ago, I did another judo comp at AC Open and I fought the Colombian guy from Melbourne. We went eight minutes in the golden score. It was unreal. And I had so much fun, but I lost the match. Yes, yeah, so I'm just keen to fight again. Probably do Gold Coast uh, in seven weeks' time. That's my plan. 
to fly up and do Gold Coast. Yeah, well, fantastic. And just have some grinding matches. Be fun. Yeah. yeah, I've doubled in a bit of BJJ and uh, definitely prefer judo. <laughs> I like, oh, yeah. I like what, throwing what, people. Yep. I like throwing people. I yeah. like them getting back up so I can throw them again. Doesn't usually happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Brazil just comes to fun, though. Yeah. Yeah, fun. Yeah, I'll do some more. I'd like to uh, continue grading. I'm on the purple belt level at the minute, so I'd like to keep working my way through. Yeah, that's right. You know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is just judo. It's just learning a in-depth yep. art on the ground. You know, it's the same thing. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Okay, Matt, uh, may wrap it up there. Really enjoyed that. Thank you for taking your time out of your day to share your, your experiences and your thoughts with us. I'd say thank you because, to be honest with you, you know, part of this, the Judah Way of Life journey, you know, was off, off the back of watching your videos on YouTube and being like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing that. Yeah, awesome. So, you know, thank you for that. Is there anything you'd like to just mention? You know, obviously you've got your books and your DVDs. Yeah, I'm actually starting this week. I upload a Judo video every Monday. Sorry, technique video every Monday because then I start putting out some Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu videos. And then every Wednesday I'm, I'm uploading a Judo workout Wednesday. So every Wednesday I'm uploading a, just a fitness workout for people. If they want to get fit, they can jump on and do that workout. So that's every Wednesday at Beyond Grappling on my YouTube channel. And yeah, keep loving Judo and Jiu-Jitsu and have fun, look after your training partners and just enjoy and just keep learning and do it forever. Make the decision to do judo forever and then uh, you will and you'll have a great time. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for that. All the best and have fun in the Gold Coast. 